afternoon class. Of, sorry. Okay. Um, our next uh, speaker for the day, all the way from Australia, Ken Flower, Dr. Ken Flower. Um, Ken is living and working in Western Australia, but his roots are firmly entrenched in Southern Africa. He is born and bred in Zimbabwe and has moved to Australia to do some work there. Ken is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Western Australia and his work is focused on managing a long-term no-till farming systems project along with the Western Australian no Tillage Farmer Association or OneFar. The aim of the GRBC funded project is to improve the quality of no tillage through the development of high residue diverse rotation farming systems. The systems include uh, controlled traffic to minimize the effects of compaction and increase cropping efficiencies. The project has a 20 hectare sites, at, um, two 20 hectare sites, one at yellow, on yellow sand and Minganu and uh, Minganu, uh, with the um, Minganu Urban Grower Group and the other on red sandy clay loam at the College of Agriculture at Kandadon. His, his knowledge does encompass farming systems research, improving no tillage systems, carbon sequestration uh, through no till crop rotations, herbicide efficacy in no till systems, cover crops, crop residue management, and crop nutrition. And I just wanted to finish off with this little tidbit. Um, on Thursday when we were at uh, Teichluck, I took a photo, and two years ago when Tom Robinson and, and Greg was here, I started on Twitter as well. And I tweeted a photo of, of, of Ken talking to some of the guys, and I got a response back from a fellow Australian, also a fellow Zimbabwean, who said, what, Ken Flower in long pants? Question mark, question mark, that must be a first for, um, uh, oh, they, uh, that's, that never happens in Western Australia. And then he put in the hashtag, world first. So um, this is a world second, Ken in long pants again. Thanks very much, Johanna. I think it's a world first as well for me to wear a blazer. I thought I was going to be very smart today, and I see I'm the only one wearing a blazer, so I apologize for that. Um, firstly, just a number of thanks to people, uh, particularly Johan um, and uh, Department of Agriculture for bringing me here. It's been a fantastic trip, and uh, all the farmers and researchers that I've met as well. Um, I've met about, I've got, you'll see there's lots of Yahans there. I've met about six or seven Yahans and about uh, five or six Pete's. So thanks very much to, to them and also MG and CD and many others that I've met. Okay, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to talk about our, our long-term farming systems trial. I'm just going to give you mainly an overview of no-till systems, current no-till systems in Western Australia. So just go through the talk quickly. I'll, um, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the farming systems, the bit of background and the soils as well. I'll then go through our current system. I think we're having a very similar system to, uh, sorry, season to what you're having here with very dry conditions, pretty harsh conditions. Uh, then I'll go through our current no-till system and the setups and uh, some of the challenges that we're facing and, and some of the innovations or changes to the system that we're having to bring in uh, to meet those challenges. And part of that as well, I'll talk a little bit about the future, some of the new technology that's coming along as well. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Western Australia, we are generally a mixed farming system, so mixed cropping livestock, and in fact, about 70% of our farmers have uh, uh, livestock, and that's mainly sheep in the wheat belt there, and about 30% are 100% croppers. The, amount, the number of 100% croppers is increasing slowly. So it is a mixed farming system. Probably a bit like yours, although I have heard it, you know, in the wet seasons, obviously waterlogging is a serious problem, it sounds like in, in the Western Cape here, but uh, rainfall is our most limiting factor, and that really uh, trying to get the most kgs of grain per millimetre of rain is the main focus of our farmers, and that's really why no-till has taken off. Just to illustrate that, I've got this... Um, uh, graph here. This is taken from our long-term no-till trial and it just shows you I'm plotting the wheat 
yield on this axis against the years, and you can see the variability of our wheat yields. Now, if I uh, put behind that the rainfall figures, um, you can see here how the rainfall figures are driving uh, really most of our response in our cropping system. And so sometimes when you, for example, put a cover crop in and you expect to get a yield response the next year, and you have a severe drought like this, um, you don't get that response. So it's quite hard to evaluate some of those systems because really rainfall is the main driver of our cropping system. Uh, just going on to a bit of background about the soils, the soils are quite infertile and fragile um, and very variable. And this uh, slide is taken from up in Menginyu, um, and you can see the variability uh, in some of our lands there. So very variable soils. Um, they tend to be uh, quite infertile. Organic carbons around um, 0.9 to 1.3 is quite a good organic carbon. And the pHs vary a lot as well, from quite acid soils, 3.5 to 3.8, going up to pHs of about 8 or 9, uh, particularly at depth. So very variable pH um, as well. The soils are fragile, and we do suffer a lot from wind erosion, and you can see here, where we have no crop residue on the soil surface, we are losing a significant amount of topsoil. And some of the farmers who used to farm on the south coast were telling us that whole sheep sheds were getting buried uh, before they went onto a no-till system. So really, crop residue is a key component of our no-till system, and if we don't have it, we tend to lose our topsoil. Now, just going on to the current season, I mean, you guys have had a very difficult season. Um, this rainfall data here is from our Cunderdon site. Um, and what you can see here, I've plotted the rainfall going up to 120 mil there against the different months. But you can see in January, February, we had 167 millimeters of rain. So actually very good summer rain. Up in the north, some patches, they didn't get that so much summer rain and uh, they're struggling even more. As a result of that summer rain, a lot of farmers uh, went in very early and started seeding in March. So that was much earlier than normal. Normally in our circumstance, farmers would start seeding around, probably around towards the end of April, mid to end of April is when the earliest guys get in there. But this year they went in even earlier because it looked like it was going to be a fantastic season, some of the best early rain, um, but it was in summer. You can see in March we had 20 mil, and then basically from April uh, through to the end of June, uh, on our Cunderdon site we had 15 mil of rain. So very low. Uh, July has been slightly better. We've had 28 millimeters of rain. And that's at Cunderdon. We have managed to get crop up there. Uh, further north and east, there's large areas with no crop at all um, because they didn't get quite as much summer rain. Um, I'll show you some, just some slides from our, our long-term trial because it really illustrates the importance of crop residue in these very dry seasons. In a slightly wetter season where things are much uh, you know, better for crop growth, sometimes you don't see uh, as easily the benefits from residue, but it's really in the dry seasons where we see that. So these plots here, they're quite big plots. Um, they're 30 meet, 36 meters by 80 meters. Uh, we do have a control traffic system in there, um, and we harvest it with a commercial harvester. This plot here has been, uh, we give a light tillage in this particular treatment. And uh, this uh, photo was taken at the end of June. And you can see we've got a few plants here. That you can see a little bit of green in the background there, but basically uh, very little, virtually no emergence happening there. Um, this is in our, one of what would be our best treatment. It's a diverse rotation. Uh, it's wheat following... Um, uh, uh, lupin, albus lupin, because it's alkaline soils, and then into canola. So very diverse rotation, a wheat, legume, brassica. Um, and this is the wheat following the canola, and we've got virtually no emergence there. Now, a lot of our farmers will grow canola after a lupin or legume, rather than canola straight after wheat, because in a no-till system, you can build up quite high levels of residue after your wheat, and canola doesn't like very, very high levels levels of, of residue it struggles to get through. And if you grow the, 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 the canola after the legume, 
that legume does help to break down that residue, and you tend to have lower levels of residue, and you get very good canola germination. Also, that canola likes the high nitrogen, and therefore it's going to pick up that nitrogen from the legume. Um, here we've got the, the wheat, follow, so it goes wheat, legume, canola, then wheat. Uh, this is showing the wheat after the canola, and again, virtually no emergence. And the key there is again in crop residue, because um, we, we don't have that much crop residue actually on the soil surface. We've got our canola stalks there. So you compare those two, so these are all taken on the same day. This is in the high residue treatment, so this is one of our uh, wheat continuous cereals. So we've got high levels of crop residue, um, and you can see the emergence of the wheat there. Uh, and it's purely a soil moisture effect, and it's from the, having the high levels of residue and being able to get the crop up. When we got those small amounts of rainfall, um, the soil maintained the moisture and we got that crop up. So really, in this season, residue has been king, and that's really uh, the message also that farmers are giving back to us as well. Uh, okay, so that's a bit about the current season. Now I'd like to go on and talk about general uh, no-till and conservation and agriculture in Western Australia, uh, go through our systems and maybe some of the things that are coming in the future. I've put this slide up here because I suppose it sort of illustrates what I would consider is a high-quality no-till system. It's got all the components of conservation agriculture. So um, one of the pillars is minimal soil disturbance. I think you'll know that. And you can see in this slide here that there's very little soil disturbance. Secondly, diverse crop rotations. Here they're planting faber beans into uh, wheat stubble. So again, you've got the diversity in there. And third component is crop residue on the soil surface, and you can see that there. So that sort of embraces all those components of a, a, a high-quality no-till system. So um, the FAO definition, you would probably know, has got those three components, minimal soil disturbance, crop rotation, permanent soil cover. I've put in here a fourth one as controlled traffic. I've put it in brackets because it's not applicable everywhere. Um, but in our system, if we've taken the tillage out and we're driving heavy machinery all over the paddocks, that is going to have an impact um, on our farming system. And therefore, controlled traffic works very well in our system because over time that you get the soil will loosen up with the roots going into the soil and you're not driving all over the whole uh, paddock and therefore control traffic system uh, is very important and that's we've got a conference coming up on, on the organizing committee in August and there's a huge interest in that. I would say at the moment somewhere around 30 percent of farmers, 25 to 30 percent have got control traffic and uh, there's a lot of interest in there, and that's what's uh, going to take off in the future. And we try and implement that where possible. So what I'll do now is I'll just go through each of those components and talk about what's happening uh, with our current no-till system, going through the minimal soil disturbance, the rotation, then the residue, and then finally the controlled traffic and a bit on precision agriculture. So minimal soil disturbance, um, most of our farmers, probably like you guys here, uh, are on a tine system. And uh, here's a farmer going through uh, seeding on, on a tine system. Uh, the tine systems work very well um, in, our, in, our, in our environment. They work across most soil types. And um, you can see that one of the benefits for us, uh, why farmers like the tines, is because you've got better incorporation of your herbicide, particularly trifluralin. So uh, when trifluralin was our major herbicide uh, and you compare tines versus discs, you never got quite the weed control with the discs because you got poorer incorporation and therefore you got more weed uh, issues. And you can see that throw, the soil throw there, getting that herbicide incorporation in there. One of the big downsides with tines is this, once you start building up high levels of residue, then you can battle to get through that. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about it later. That's where sort of a control traffic system uh, and having a high accuracy GPS guidance really can help with your stubble management with tines. Um, here's a typical setup. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got our tine here, this farmer, um, tie forward. 
He's got stubble tubes on the front, so that's a bit of steel or, or some other pipe on the front of his cedar, on front of the tine, and that helps with stubble flow, um, reduces the catch points on the tine there. He's then got his tine, uh, he's got liquid end coming down this tube here with the granular fertilizer, and then he's got his seed boot uh, back here, and um, he's got uh, twin rows there. A number of farmers are now going to twin rows um, rather than a single row, and the main, one of the main reasons is for weed competition. Most of our farmers are on about 25 to 30 centimeter spacing, and there's no doubt that the closer your spacing, the better the competition of the crop against the weeds. And, uh, you know, the closer you go, the more difficult it is to manage residue as well, um, because, you, you know, you've got more tines on the system. So uh, if you're at the slightly wider spacing, having that twin row helps to reduce that, the, the, the bare area in the middle, and you get better weed competition in there. So that's really a taking off there. And then this farm is spraying a wetting agent at the end uh, because non-wetting soils or hydrophobic soils, the soils that you pour water on and it just runs off, uh, is a m massive problem in Western Australia. I'm not going to talk much more about that because I believe it's not such an issue here. Um, the wetting agents have some benefits, but the, the, the response is quite variable. Um, what's new, what's coming, um, they are doing some work at University of uh, South Australia on this bent leg tine um, where it's got this bend, bend there and uh, the main reason, I believe the idea came from a uh, farmer here in South Africa and uh, the, it's pr quite similar I think to the old paraflower which is a sort of a, 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 a bent tine there. Um, and the main reason is you can seed much faster because you get much less soil throw. And um, so that's some of the work that's going on at, on at the moment. If you go too fast with a normal time, you're going to be throwing obviously soil treated with herbicide into the next row. So that's where the developments are with, with that. The next uh, system that I'll talk about uh, with the minimal soil disturbance is obviously the, the disk system. The disc generally will have much le less soil disturbance than the, the tine, and it's probably s sort of uh, the next step after tines. But, um, you know, that, that disc system, the benefits of the disc system are that it can, the main benefit is it can handle high levels of crop residue. It's also very uniform seed placement. But having said that, it takes a lot more trial and error to get a disc system going in your, on your particular farm. Uh, and one disc system doesn't fit uh, all farms. Use, you probably find the time system is quite applicable across many farms. So in the, here we've got the disc. This is an NDF single disc. Um, we use it on our trials. Uh, we've got a row cleaner at the front, big single disc there. And um, we've got a closer a wheel here and then the press wheel at the back. Uptake of disc systems in, our, in Western Australia, about 3 to 4%, I would think, of growers uh, have the disc system. Where it fits in very well is if on larger farms, if uh, farmers have two systems, seeding systems, they've got a tine and a disc. And if they've got some more difficult soils, or soils that have had a bit of compaction from livestock on them, from overgrazing, you can get in there with the tine system. And then those that are, have been in longer term in the no-till system, building up high levels of residue, a bit softer, then they can use the disk system in there. One of the issues in the past with the disks, as I've mentioned previously, is the weed control has not been as good with tines because of the lack of or reduced incorporation. Um, but with the new herbicides, Sakura and Boxer, Gold, uh, they don't have that same requirement for incorporation and therefore they are much better suited to the disk system. So that's uh, a big change that's come along there. Um, one of my students did some work uh, some years ago looking at incorporation across uh, with the different systems and different speeds of seeding and so on. I won't go into all the results, but as I think we know here, what he did here was he sprayed a dye on the surface and then ran uh, different tines and discs at different speeds and looked at incorporation. But you can see here, there's the, the soil surface, the original one, 
and the herbicide, or in this case the dye, is there, and you can see how much incorporation you've got with the tine. With the disc, after running that through there, uh, there is a bit of soil throw onto there, but there's still quite a little, lot of the uh, dye still visible on the soil surface, and that's the reason why with trifluralin uh, we had an issue. But as I say, with Sakura and Boxer, that's much less of an issue. Uh, seasonal differences. One of the problems, like uh, the guys who had that summer rain, the moisture is deeper down, and so some guys have needed to seed a bit deeper than they normally would, and that's where they would have struggled with the, with the disc system and the time they can dig in and put that seed down onto the moisture. Um, and then, obviously, in systems that are overgrazed, where you don't have the residue on the soil surface and it's pretty hard, that's not ideal for a disc system. Uh, and that's where the tines work across all systems. So that disc is really suited to a farmer who's really set up a system for conservation agriculture and he's building up the crop residue. And, uh, and he can't handle that with a tine. That's where a disc really fits in very well. Um, so in that system, and, and I think I mentioned earlier how um, I, if moisture is the key uh, limiting variable in your farming system, then crop residue on the soil surface is one of the main things you can do to keep that moisture there. Also, um, I, I mentioned a little bit of trial and error. You know, you, you'll get a disc system that doesn't seem to work very well, but those farmers who, who want to keep that residue and get that system right, there are many things you can do to the disc system to improve its efficacy. So uh, you can put different coulters at the front. You get the different wavy coulters here, the 8th wave going down to the 25 wave. Um, the 8th wave there is not so good at penetrating hard soil, uh, but it does cut residue nicely and it can throw uh, soil, it throws more soil. Um, whereas the 25 uh, wave there is actually better at penetrating hard soil. You also get these bubble and ripple discs, so they can cut and they also throw a reasonable, reasonable amount of soil. So you can get different coulters to try and do different jobs if you want to incorporate a bit of fertilizer or something like that. But um, it does take a bit of expertise and trial and error to get it really working in your system. So that's all I talk about our, our seeding systems. But I'd like to just go still dealing with minimal soil disturbance because that is a, is a key component of no-till. We do have some issues in our farming systems. So we have a number of subsoil constraints. Compaction is a big one. And a number of guys went to no-till some years ago and they still had a compaction layer down there. And uh, what they're finding is that uh, by uh, ripping in that system, they alleviated that compaction. And then they go back to a controlled traffic system, so they're not then driving over that, uh, those fields that they've just ripped up. If you drive over it again, you're going to get compaction again. So um, compaction is an issue. Subsoil acidity, if you've got subsoil acidity down deep, the only way to get lime down there really uh, fast is to incorporate it. So that will need some intervention and water repellents. The other challenge is herbicide resistance, and some farmers are using a moldboard plow as a one-off, as a one-off to reset that herbicide resistance clock. So the resistant weeds on the surface, and you're putting those resistant weeds down at 30 centimeters, and then you leave them there. If you come in there and plow after that, you're just bringing them back up again. So it's a one-off to uh, set that re reset that resistance clock. So there is a little bit of uh, tillage going on, but it's one-off strategic tillage, and it's, then the farmers would go back to the no-till system. Um, I mentioned the ripping. Uh, so farmers who had compaction, if you've got a serious problem with compaction, then you need some intervention. Um, and uh, that could be done biologically with using, there's a tillage radish, etc. Um, we've struggled to get the tillage radish in the very dry areas, and so farmers are using a little bit of ripping. Another thing that they, they're trialing out, I thought you may be interested, are these inclusion plates. So what they're doing here is behind the ripper time, they've got these plates um, that basically 
keep that, uh, that rip line open for a bit. So they're a bit below the soil surface, so those are in, actually in the soil. It does increase your horsepower quite a bit, um, but it's keeping that soil open. And then what you get is the topsoil falling down that rip line. Because one of the things is if you rip it um, and you know, you're not putting any amendments down there, uh, farmers were finding it was closing up and they were, you know, that the effectiveness of that ripping wasn't lasting very long. So what they're trying to do, you've got your, some organic carbon in the topsoil, they're trying to get it down the rip line, and also if you've lined as well, that gets some of that line down that rip line and it helps keep that open more. So that's what these inclusion plates are. So that's still a work in progress. So I'm not recommending it. Uh, farmers are try doing trial and error with that, but they are, some farmers are getting a good response with those inclusion plates. Here you can see where the rip has gone through and you can see that organic matter near, near that rip line is falling down that rip line with the hope that it will keep those rip lines open and just keep that soil softer at depth as well and get a yield response from that. Uh, here's a farm up near Minganyu where we went to visit uh, at, uh, last season and you can see the difference between where he'd ripped um, and had no ripping uh, because he had that compaction layer. But as I say, the key here is once you've ripped or, or done those amendments, then going to control traffic so you're not driving over it and compacting it again. Okay, moving on to the next thing uh, of those conservation agriculture components uh, is crop rotation. Um, there's no, probably like farmers here, there's no set crop rotation. It depends on the prices of the grain. Um, it depends on your, on your farming system, whether you need feed for livestock, etc. But um, what a number of farmers might follow is wheat. They might do two cereals, wheat, wheat, or wheat, barley. Um, even three cereals, wheat, wheat, barley, and then going to a legume. Um, this is chickpeas. Chickpeas are starting to have a bit of a resurgence. We had problems with disease, but there's some new disease-tolerant varieties coming out. That legume is either going to be chickpeas, uh, field peas, uh, or lupins, generally. And then going to the canola. I mentioned earlier that canola does very well after the legume because you've got the nitrogen fixation, and also that legume has helped break down some of that cereal residue, so you've got slightly lower levels of residue. Um, to enable the canola to come up easily, and that works very well. So that's a system that seems to be working pretty well. Um, I, I was just looking through some data. It gives you the proportion of the different crops, and it also gives you an idea of the, of the rotations. But um, So in this, bar, this pie chart here, you can see that the, 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 the gold or yellow part there is wheat. So 60% of our, of our crops is wheat. Um, the barley there is the blue here, that's 6%. So between 65 to 70% of our crop grown is cereals. Uh, we have canola, which is 12%. Um, so that's a pretty significant part in our rotation. And that can increase or decrease quite rapidly. If the canola price goes up, farmers will tend to move into that. Um, and then you can see lupin is around 6% or, uh, and Field peas have tended to drop off a bit. Um, and then we've got the pasture around 12%. So that would be regenerating pasture, maybe with some medics, clovers. Uh, they have the other ones, cerradellos, bicerulas, various uh, legume pastures. And the ideal there would be using hard seed or dormant seed that can last for many years. You go into that, what I'd say, non, you're not going to seed anything, and those pastures will regenerate. Um, and so it's like a sort of cover crop. In the high rainfall areas, you're tending to get more diversity, so probably slightly less cereal than I've got here, and more canola and pasture. Uh, and there's a possibility, there's a few guys uh, trialing different cover crops and, and pastures in there. In the low rainfall areas, right out in the east, very dry, harsh conditions, we tend to have even more cereals because the cereals are much less risky. In our long-term trial, uh, I found one of the most profitable, rot well, it's not a rotation, is continuous wheat. Um, and equal to that and probably mo even more profitable is a diverse rotation, wheat, legume, canola. If we get the 
the canola in the good years. Um, because in our trials we have every phase of the rotation presented every year, some of the same, so that same rotation, but if you hit the canola in the bad years, that is actually the least profitable of the rotation. So it's indicating that some of those other crops are more risky, and that's why you can see that the growers in the wetter areas tend to use more of those different crops, whereas in the very dry areas, right out on the east, there's more cereals because it's less risky. So in those low rainfall areas, we tend not to have any cover crops, uh, more cereals, they, and there's more uh, sort of regenerated pastures. So that would be your medics, clovers that can just regenerate, hopefully fix some nitrogen, and that's going to be a benefit, a low cost uh, situation that's going to benefit your next wheat crop. There is some fallow coming in there as well, where farmers uh, call it to try and drought proof their canola, so they might grow uh, you know, three years of wheat, um, then maybe put in a legume, or just go three years of wheat, have a fallow, and make sure there's no weed in that fallow. And then that is taking water and nitrogen into the next uh, canola crop. So they're trying to drought-proof that. But clearly, if we're wanting to improve our soils and build up soil organic carbon, that fallow in the system is not good from that point of view. So it would be much better to get those regenerating pastures going in that system to fix nitrogen as well. Um, we have done work on cover crops. Um, here you can see we had a vetch. Um, it was a vetch uh, oat mix, and we've knife rolled it down there. In this instance, we probably had too much uh, le um, cereal in there. Uh, for me, I, I think really uh, for, for a benefit for a cover crop should have a very high legume component with a little bit of cereal in there to provide some cover because the legume cover is going to break down quite quickly. And therefore, having much more legume in there to give you nitrogen, it's that benefit for that wheat crop, and that's where you can see those benefits. Um, and the other one, as I say, this is taken from our, our trip recently to some of your Huns trials, and um, you know, looking at uh, regenerated pastures, we see some magnificent pastures, those farmers who, who can manage that. And um, even if that's, not, if that's grazed, uh, likely, then that's all the better, you're getting some livestock use there. Um, or if it's not grazed, then that's going to fix a lot of nitrogen and add more diversity in your system. Okay, then moving on to the permanent crop residue cover. Um, you probably have heard maybe Rolf Dirch and others talking about crop residue cover, where they've done work that showed that no till with no residue was actually worse than conventional tillage where you've plowed all that residue in. So uh, cover is one of the key components of that no-till system. Now, um, I'll, what I'd like to do is just give you some results about one of the things about cover. We know cover's good. It's good for soil biolo biology. It's good for soil moisture. It reduces erosion. I'm sure most of you farmers here are very aware of all those things. So I'm not going to go into all the benefits of cover. We know mulch in a garden is a very good thing. Um, but how do we tackle some of the issues? Cover is not all fantastic because there are some issues associated with cover. And one of them is herbicide efficacy. If you have a thick blanket on top of your soil and you're spraying a herbicide on there, most of that herbicide, or a large proportion, could be uh, basically intercepted by that stubble. And it's not getting onto the soil. So what is the effect of that cover on herbicide efficacy? So I had a student, a PhD student, uh, Yassine Khalil, who did some work on that, where he was looking at basically spraying different herbicides onto residue with the soil underneath, and he was looking at three herbicides, trifluralin, sakura, and boxagold. And what he did, he was looking at the effect of, um, of, of what sort of how much is intercepted, and then if you got rainfall immediately afterwards, how much is that washed off? If you've got rainfall a week after that, how much is washed off? If you've got rainfall 14 days, two weeks afterwards, how much of that herbicide is washed off? Um, yeah, you can imagine if you have a situation like this where you've knife rolled a sayer road cover crop um, and then, yeah, you might say that weeds are smothering it, but what we found is where, where our cedar runs go through, especially if we open it up a bit, we're getting ryegrass coming along where the crop is. 
Um, and so, um, you know, we need, we need to know the efficacy of those herbicides. So this is the, the, the work that Yassine did, and I mentioned the different treatments. So if we spend a little bit of time just going through this, on this axis here, I've plotted ryegrass growth. So essentially that's the shoot length, the, the, length, the height of the ryegrass, as a percentage of the untreated control. So if it gets to 100% or near there, then basically the treatment is having no effect. So the taller the bars are, uh, the worse the control. And then what I've got on this axis here is the timing of the rainfall after the herbicide application. So going from zero, that's applying rainfall straight after we've applied the herbicide, going down to 14 days, applying rainfall 14 days after we put the herbicide on. And he used different rainfall amounts, going from a control with no rainfall, 5, 10, up to 20 mils of rainfall. So he's looking at how much rainfall is required to wash that herbicide off. What's interesting here, if you look at the blue bars, the blue bars are essentially with no rainfall. So um, you can see immediately afterwards, well basically, some of that herbicide, we had four tons per hectare of crop residue on the soil surface there. So even though with that high level of residue, some herbicide is getting through onto the soil, which is a good thing, because we are getting some weed control there. But what's interesting with Sakura, even with five mil of rain, applied up to 14 days. So here, you can see here, five mil of rain applied 14 days afterwards, we got no ryegrass growth. So that's indicating that Sakura can last 14 days. We didn't go any further than that, but at least 14 days on the residue. If you get rain after that, at least five mil, it's gonna wash a lot of that herbicide off into the soil. So i.e. I, Sakura is ideal, for that high residue scenario and it will wash off into the soil. If we look at box of gold, it's a bit of a different story. Um, so this showing you the same parameters there on the graph with box of gold. If we look here at zero, so this is rainfall applied immediately after applying the box of gold. You can see with um, no with no rainfall, um, some herbicide was getting through. Um, but what you can see here is with rainfall, we are getting a significant reduction in ryegrass growth. So some of that box is leaching off the stubble, that's great. But, oops, sorry. But once we get up to about seven days, we're still getting some effect, but at 14 days, no effect there. So uh, box of gold is a little bit intermediate. We were getting some wash off of the herbicide off the stubble into the soil after seven days, but after that, nothing much else there. A trifluralin was very variable. Um, we got an effect early on, immediately afterwards, and maybe six hours, that's 0.25 days, so six hours after uh, putting the herbicide on. But really, much after that, it was too variable there. We weren't getting any wash-off effect. So the trifluralin doesn't wash off. It might do immediately afterwards. You might get a bit of benefit, but really, much after that, um, you're not getting much benefit from uh, rainfall washing off that trifluralin. So in summary, most herbicide was leached from the stubble into the soil with higher rainfall amounts, although, interestingly, 5 mil was nearly as good as 20, but not quite. But 5 mil could still do a good job, particularly with Sakura. Uh, the sooner the, after the herbicide uh, was applied, um, the better the, the response, and that also makes sense. But as I say, Sakura can go up to 14 days. We tended to get better results with one rainfall event rather than multiple. The intensity of rainfall had no effect. So if we applied the same amount of rainfall at different intensities, that had no effect. It was actually just the total amount. This was also interesting. We found that uh, less herbicide was leached after rainfall when the chemicals were applied to dry stubble compared to wet stubble. So you can imagine going and spraying your field and the stubble is dry, you've had no rainfall. You then get rain after that, maybe up to seven days afterwards or whatever, uh, you're gonna get more herbicide leached from there into the soil to get ryegrass control than if that stubble was already wet. So if the stubble was already wet, we tended to get less herbicide leaching from there. And then again, Sakura leached easily from the residue, provided good weed control for up to 14 days. Boxer was intermediate, 
that lasted up to seven days, but with less coming off there, and the trifluralin, pretty much you need the rain immediately afterwards to get any wash off. So that um, covers that aspect. Um, now looking at the weeds and herbicides. Uh, herbicide resistance, as I've mentioned, is actually quite a bit, it's a big problem in Western Australia. And, um, you know, in the past, particularly, a lot of farmers were, were, were burning the stubble um, because that would reduce the amount of weeds carried over. Um, but that burning, it can be quite catastrophic. If you have conditions in WA where you get strong winds after that, you can lose an inch of topsoil in one, in one big wind event. So you're losing a lot of your, a lot of your organic matter at the top, and therefore it's not really that uh, sustain a sustainable system at all. So we know overall stubble is beneficial, so how do we manage the negatives in terms of weed control? Well, I've talked a little bit about the herbicides and, and the use of, of some of the herbicides like Sequoia. Uh, you may have heard that in Western Australia there's quite a bit of windrow burning, so instead of burning the whole field, uh, what some farmers are putting the uh, chaff and the straw down in a windrow, and then just burning that windrow. And that reduces significantly, that's actually more effective than burning the whole field. You get much better ryegrass control by doing that because you get much higher temperatures in a, in a confined area, and that's where most of your weeds are that come out in the chaff. And, uh, and then you've got stubble for the rest of it. But I was talking to some growers here, and I mean, if you're getting four tons a hectare of wheat, you're getting a lot of stubble in there. To try and burn a windrow may be impossible in your, in your scenario with high yields. But if you've got lower yields, that might be feasible. But there's also quite a bit of labor required in there and a bit of expertise to burn under the right conditions and so on. So it's extra management that has to go in there. So now I'd like to talk about another um, fairly new development that's happening in Western Australia to manage this. It's not just herbicide resistance challenge, but just weed control in generally. Um, and that's uh, managing it at harvest. So we have windrow burning, but you know when you're harvesting your crop, uh, if the weeds haven't shed the seeds, you're basically taking them into the harvester and then you're planting them nicely by spreading them out behind the harvester. So the idea here is actually to catch those weeds, which will tend, the weed seeds will tend to be in the chaff fraction. Okay, and what we want to do here is to, these farmers, are, what they, they, they've uh, developed is to put that chaff fraction on the, on, the, on the wheel tracks. So instead of, you're spreading your stubble out nicely over the soil, which is needed there, but just the chaff fraction is being directed from the harvester and just put on the wheel tracks there. And that works really well. Uh, quite a cheap, um, some farmers have made their own, this, these ones you can buy, but a number of farmers have made their own modifications on there, and it works really well as, as well as the bought ones. And I think you can just see it here, you can see the chaff lines coming out there. So that, that contains the chaff and your weed seeds. So you're putting your weed seeds into a very contained area. And here you can see those two chaff decks, were basically the chaff coming out there, dropping on the wheel tracks directly behind the harvester, and the stubble is being spread out the back. Um, this slide here, you can see the chaff, so it's a controlled traffic system, so all the traffic's going down there, and you can see the weed seeds uh, with the chaff, and the weed seeds are, are put on there. And here, you can see there, so we're not spreading all this ryegrass out over the field, it's basically going on the wheel track. And you can manage that however you like. So you can, uh, a lot of farmers, if, if it's thick enough, it develops like a, almost like a compost. It gets hot in there, and, it's, and you're driving over it. It's quite a harsh environment for those weeds to proliferate, so they don't do well. But the other thing, I mean, if you were concerned about that, you could easily put a shielded sprayer over here and put a, you know, put a, a paraquat or something and spray it just in, that, in, a, in a shield. At least the weeds are there where you can actually manage them. And this is really taken off in Western Australia because it's a cheap modification and it's harvest weed seed management. It's basically a non-herbicide way of controlling the weeds, and it is actually having a big impact on our, on our herbicide resistance management. 
Um, finally, going to a more expensive op option, and this is the Rolls-Royce, and Rolls-Royce is expensive anyway, but the Harrington Seed Destructor, this uh, farmer, Ray Harrington, um, he, he was grappling with that problem. I'm, I'm getting the weed seeds through my harvester, and now I'm just spreading them back out on the field. So he thought, can't we microwave them or whatever? And, he's, and he was looking, I think, at how they powder coal up, and, he, and this cage mill can, can you know, m break up stones or anything. He thought, if I can get one of those going, that should be able to handle the chaff. So what they do here, it's a cage mill. It, this original one has its own power unit. The chaff goes through there uh, and is basically mashed up and it kills 95% 90, of the weeds in there. And then basically the, um, the straw comes underneath here and the chaff and the straw are spread out the back there. So all of your residue with basically no weed seeds are then spread out the back. Um, but obviously you've got to pull that thing behind your harvester. Um, so the new modifications, the IHSD is Integrated Harrington Destructor, basically is, uh, they fit it in the back of the harvester there, and so it's all integrated and obviously uh, under the warranty, etc. So uh, on some of those harvesters. So that's the way things are going. Um, but the cheaper option, and probably what most farmers are doing, is actually using that option where they're putting the chaff on the wheel tracks and managing it that way. Finally, on to the last section, and that's to do with the um, control traffic farming. As I said, if you're taking tillage out of the system and you're driving all over your paddocks, uh, you are going to be impacting your yield. And this was taken from Western Australian farmer, and you can see the, how much traffic is going over there, and therefore you're losing yield. Because, uh, and if you do NDVI or biomass images there, you'll find that these are the low biomass areas and the low yield areas. So you are losing yield there. So farmers, uh, uh, a number of them are now going on to control traffic, and it's a work in progress. I mean, this farmer here has got all his uh, sprayers and his harvester matched, and so he's only driving on those areas. The rest is not trafficked at all. It's just getting softer and softer, and that's where he's really gaining in terms of yield. But some farmers, it's a work in progress. It can take 12 years to get all of your wheels matched, etc. But that's where a number of farmers are heading. It's not a one-off thing um, and can be done, obviously, over time. What are some of the benefits you can get from that? As well as a direct yield improvement, as I've talked about because of the compaction. Um, what you can do, if you have two centimetre accuracy auto steer or guidance, you can see here, we've got the old stubble rows and you can see where the moisture is. So we've got a little bit of early rain, and basically the moisture is where those old stubble rows are. So if you've got the two centimeter accuracy, then what the farmer can do then is nudge his GPS over, so he's just seeding adjacent to the, the, those old stubble rows, and he would seed right next to there into that, stubble, into that moisture. He can then get his crop up under those very dry conditions. If it's wet, and you're growing wheat on wheat, you tend to get a significantly higher disease, crown rot, etc., from planting your crop right next to the stubble. And therefore, if it's wet, farmer makes a decision and he moves his seeding row down to the middle here, where you get much less crown rot. So if it's a wet, good early start, you'll seed in the middle there. If it's dry, he'll nudge over and get his germination in there. So you can use that to really, you're tweaking the system to get that crop up. Um, I did some work with a farmer. It was actually with a guy, uh, with a farmer and one of the GPS uh, ag companies, and they wanted us to do some work to look at the benefit of interrow seeding because you can manage your stubble really nicely with interrow seeding. Um, you can cut your stubble slightly higher and seed in between the stubble rows. Manage your stubble with tines quite easily, and they wanted me to do some work on that. We were seeding canola into wheat stubble. And um, actually the reverse happened. Because it was a dry season, you can see on, on your right here, this is on-row seeding, and this is inter-row seeding. Okay, and it's purely that moisture effect I talked about earlier. So in fact, um, and that's when we started to realize, actually by putting the seed where the moisture was, in dry conditions, you can really significantly improve your crop yield by being able to put, uh, really manage where that seed goes. And you can see the result there. 
and uh, I mentioned uh, stubble management here, this farmer is seeding wheat on wheat into high residue conditions and he's managing the residue really well by putting those rows in there. Uh, finally, I thought you might be interested, there's some farmers uh, uh, testing out and playing with precision seeding with canola. Uh, uh, you're probably aware a lot of our farmers grow Roundup Ready or hybrids. The, the seed is quite expensive and therefore we're trying to reduce the seed costs by reducing the, the seed rates. So um, this is a farmer, Brad Jones in Tamman, uh, who's got a precision seeder. I think it might be one of the first tine precision seeders. He's got his tines here with his uh, seed box on there. Um, so he's trying to reduce the seed rate down to about 500 to 800 grams. Um, and they've even trialed 300 uh, uh, grams a hectare of, of that. And that significantly reduces um, his costs. So that's still a, a work in progress, but that's where farmers are looking at at the moment with precision seeding uh, with, with your high value uh, crops like hybrid canola. Something uh, coming up now is also um, the use of drones. You may have heard a lot about drones and how they can take pretty pictures of your, of your systems. They've been around for a while, but one of the key problems um, is that, you know, to, it's all very nice to take pictures but how is that going to help the farmer? What, what can the farmer, what decisions can the farmer make that's going to save him money or improve his system uh, using this technology? And there was one presented at a recent crop update, and I thought you might be interested. It just shows some of the potential there. Um, so these, this is right, um, on a farm in Western Australia where they, have had an, they had an issue with Rhizoctonia bear patch. And one of the characteristics about Rhizoctonia is you get these circular patches, um, and you can see it here. So uh, this farm has got Rhizoctonia there. So the drone went up, took these images, uh, and you can use some, some uh, fancy programming to basically pull out the shape, which is round, particularly. Um, so you can pull out the low areas and distinguish them from something the cedar might have done or, or something like that and they can quickly identify those areas. Okay, then uh, this farm is on control traffic. What they do then is they, they map out the percentage rhizoctonia infection in there um, based on the ND, those NDVI um, they, they created from there, so from those maps. But basically for each of these cedar runs there, where it's red, it's more than 20% rhizoctonia infection, going down to 1% uh, and then the green areas with no rhizoctonia infection. So that farmer coming through with a cedar there, if he can do variable rate, he would basically only spray his uh, in-row fungicide if last year, if he had a high rating for rhizoctonia there. So instead of putting your fungicide on the whole crop, he's just targeting those areas uh, where the rhizoctonia infection is. And that reduces your fungicide input quite significantly. All right, and then finally, this is the last slide. I thought you may be interested. One of the things about um, controlled traffic farming is that you want to get maximum efficiency from your machinery. So you want the longest runs possible to get that efficiency. So a number of farmers have pulled out fences you know, and joined fields together to get the longest run and the maximum efficiency. And then the question may be, but if the livestock prices go up, I can't go back into, live, into livestock because I've taken all my fences out. But there's a relatively new technology that's um, just sort of coming out at the moment, and that's called virtual fencing. So um, instead of having to uh, put in physical fences, basically um, you can do it virtually. So um, this work was done by CSIRO, developed by CSIRO, and um, Kurt, I got this information from Dr. Manners, but there's a company, um, Agisons or Agisons, uh, a small startup company who are developing this technology. Um, and so it's just coming out at the moment. It, it's, the application here, I think you'll see, it could be many, many areas. It's not just for control traffic farming. I just put it in that context. But basically what they did here originally was they put collars on these livestock, okay, and with a GPS. So um, then they can track where the livestock are going. And essentially on your, on your system, you can basically put, uh, put a line almost with your iPad where if, if the animal walks near that line, it gets a bit of a noise and then it knows not to go there. If it goes even further, it can get a little bit of a shock. 
and then it goes back again. So essentially you can use a virtual fence, so you don't need any fences in there. And so I thought I'd show you this. Um, hopefully this uh, works. So essentially these, oh, I should say that they had the collars, but they're reducing the size. And I've, um, for if, if I got what they're saying correctly, they're now having them in sort of ear tags. So they'll have the GPS receiver and, and the systems in, in the ear tags. So it's being min miniaturized, and you could manage your livestock um, remotely. So what, what, what they've done there is um, you've got this field here. And you can see that yellow line that uh, they've drawn in there. So that's hopefully where they're going to... Um... I'm not seeing anything up here. We had it. A... Oh, yeah. Okay, so there it's going. So that's one of the technologies coming, but I think even the livestock producers here will see that um, this sort of technology has great potential. Thanks very much, Johan, that's all. It's just maybe switch over so that Wendy and, and Ken also know that uh, maybe uh, when we start doing the questions, Wendy, you can tell the the guys about what you, you're planning with the cover crops, with the coating around it, um, so that it breaks down over time. Um, remember, just I mean, you, can, you can talk to them about that as well. And please do ask these guys questions. That's what the session is there for. And just when, after we've finished with the, the question and answer session, um, we're just going to thank every, um, everyone, and then all peace will, will finish off for us um, at the, right at the end. All right. Um, so, ons volgende spreker is Saki Rest. Saki, kom ons nog nader kom. Um, ons het nou vir Saki vir jaar, hy, hy is ook op ons kom met thee, en ons het vir jaar op een paar mannen gevra om te praat, maar niemand het was les om te praat, en, en op die eind het ons Saki sy arm gedraai, en um, Saki het ook ingewillig om te praat. Um, so, as een brief, volgende jaar wil ons, wil ons vir haar probeer om, om, om um, ek wil sommer nou voorbereid maak vir volgende jaar, gaan ons op weer een paar van julle nader, jy kan in Afrikaans praat, so moet nie bang, jy sê, jy is, as ons kom en jy is bereid om te praat, sê vir ons so, dat ons, ons wil meer boerensprekers ook heen, um, en ken het nou gepraat oor, oor die kontraltrafiek, ons, die plan is, ons het in contact met die, met die boer van Australië, um, en, en ek, van die ouwe sal weet, Hendrik Schoenveld wil het begin met, 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 met kontraltrafiek by hulle, en die boer met hulle in contact gekom het, gaan ons, is die plan om volgende jaar uit te bring na ons toe, om te kom praat daar oor. Hy het ook oor een tydperk oorgeskakel, en um, sal woord interessant te wees. 